This is David Marler, UFO researcher, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and I am delighted to be joined by a guest, which seems for the first time in a long time. My guest today is a professor of biological anthropology at Montana Tech in Butte, Montana, author of the books Identified Flying Objects and The Very Pop and the, the Very Pop and Pop the Model, and model. now his latest and book, now his Revelation, latest book, the, Revelation Future Human, the Future Human Past, making his third appearance, making his third on, appearance on, podcast, on the podcast, podcast, a very long overdue one, overdue one, one Dr. Michael Pete Dr. Masters. Michael, Pete Michael, welcome Masters. back to the Michael, podcast. Welcome back to- Thanks, Andy. It's always a pleasure to chat with you, and um, yeah, glad we could get this done. Well, it was August 2022 you were last on, so it's been a, a hell of a year in that time. A whole lot's happened in the world of UFOs. Has it? I don't know. Oh. I haven't really noticed much. That's, that's interesting you say that. <laughs> I'm sure you've got enough material for 10 more books just off the yeah. last couple of weeks, wow. uh, the way things nuts. have gone. And we're going to get to the book. We're going to talk about the last few months in the last year. But just first, a little recap from yourself, because people may have heard me, people may have heard you, but there may be some newer listeners to this. And while we've gone into depth in your past on previous podcasts, if you could just recap your background, that would be fantastic, Michael. Yeah, sure. So um, I am a biological anthropologist at Montana Tech University. I guess you already covered that part. But it's um, one of the top science and engineering schools in the Pacific Northwest. And um, yeah, a lot of my research centers on um, human evolutionary anatomy. I also uh, dabble in biomedical studies related to visual acuity and uh, run some archaeological digs in and around the area. Um, But the reason I'm talking to you, nobody really cares about any of that stuff anymore, as it turns out. But uh, recently got into UFOs. God, I guess it wasn't recently at all. It's eight years old, which seems like eons ago. But as far as my academic pursuit of this question, I started writing a book about whether or not they could be us from the future, coming back to visit and study themselves in their own evolutionary past, uh, around 2012, published that in 2019, and then took a different approach where that one was mostly rooted in physics, astronomy, astrobiology, and obviously anthropology, to look at whether this could be a possibility. What's the evidence that maybe the extraterrestrial hypothesis isn't the best explanation? It still could be a part of it, obviously. But what else is going on with regard to the phenomenon that might indicate they are actually our descendants coming back to visit their hominin evolutionary past? And then the second book kind of flipped that and uh, mostly focused on the abductee contactee accounts and what we can learn from those, looking at patterns across these and kind of trying to tease out what might be happening with regard to both their origins and intent. So which of these various models might help explain the phenomenon just uh, based on an abductive, more parsimonious approach. And yeah, the last one was uh, written on sabbatical, was on sabbatical last year and had a TV project fall through um, quite tragically because the CEO died unexpectedly and they had to drop everything in development. So um, decided to write a very different approach, but still focusing on the same question of time traveling future humans, but in the context of a satirical science fiction novel. So all three of them are very different, but still convey basically the same information. Absolutely. And again, just before we get to the book, uh, I'm an idiot. I'm a layman. Uh, what does a biological anthropologist do and what necessarily is the crossover if any into ufos what's the tie in there yeah that's a great question um so in the field of anthropology we have four main subfields there's uh archaeology which is part of what we do a lot of people think it's separate but it is actually a subfield of the broader field of anthropology Then you have cultural anthropology. They're the ones that go out and study remote tribes. And obviously the field has changed a lot, but historically that's what they did. Linguistic anthropologists who study language, the interplay between demographics and language, language evolution, what happens with different linguistic groups come together with language contact. And then, yeah, my specific field of biological anthropology also has a number of disciplines within it. So we have geneticists, we have uh, primatologists who study Uh, non-human primates, paleoanthropologists, which is technically my specialty, where we look at everything going back to 
the last common ancestor with chimpanzees about six to eight million years ago. So all of our upright walking hominin clade, and we investigate that both in the context of genetics and morphology um, and even tools to some extent, even though that kind of falls into the area of archaeology. I, I joked in one of my books on a dig where I worked in southern France at a site called Chepino uh, a that we would square off. We had these epic soccer matches or football, as you call it there. And uh, it was between the boners and the stoners because the stoners were the ones that just looked at the lithics. And then us boners were the ones that study the morphology. And, and there were almost equal numbers of us. So it, it ended up being pretty fun out on the pitch. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what I do. And um, like I said, you know, there's a lot of overlap with uh, biomedicine because we can apply our knowledge of evolutionary change and genetics to real world questions about health and well-being and medicine. Um, so there's some crossover there. In fact, there's a whole nother subfield called medical anthropology, which my sister-in-law does. Um, so yeah, to get to your <laughs> actual question, that was a long-winded response. I apologize. Um, the overlap, there is a lot of overlap. I actually chose this field because of this question. I mentioned that I started this pursuit when I was eight and I knew I wanted to um, learn enough to actually answer to myself and perhaps others. And I found out there's a ton of other people who have also thought this for a very long period of time to figure out if it could be accurate or not, if it might be what these visitors are. So I went into physics and astronomy as an undergraduate at Ohio University in Southern Ohio, and then switched to biological anthropology around my sophomore year because uh, I thought that this would be a better way to look at the phenomenon, so not in the context of the craft. I obviously went deep into that in my first book, too, because you have to. But what about the beans? What about the ones that are seen piloting them? So I actually, you know, it's not that I got into the UFO question. I kind of got into biological anthropology because of the UFO question. Yeah, I like that. Um, let's get into the book then, because there's a lot to dissect and talk about in this one. And just the, the mention there of the fact it was an abandoned or cancelled tv project due to like you say tragic circumstances that makes a lot of sense when people pick up the book and just if they open it and flick through some pages it it looks like a script and we'll get to that but first off i've got to give a shout out to the artists who designed oh, the book yeah, cover for sure. folks will know dan zetterstrom who regularly joins me on this podcast is on the social media is, is very much a big part of what i do Ooh. and what we do here um but along with his creative partner olaf rockner people on socials might know olaf um, they combined to form 33 ounce creative they designed the cover for the book highly recommend anyone who's looking for any creative consultancy or or work needing done speak to dan and olaf um get in touch i'll put the link in the description as well if i remember i should do um but uh michael i don't want to well, get hang, hang on wrong. let me mention something too i've had some funny yeah, synchronicities go. uh recently so uh, a guy who i've known he was actually a student in my class in like 2012 I just found out all, all of this this week, so it was kind of funny. Um, but he was a student in 2012. We kind of became friends. We've been out elk hunting a number of times. He used to be the professional uh, bow hunting elk guide. Uh, he was on all the outdoor channels and stuff. But so he took, he's, he's had a, a number of strange pictures that he's captured on his game cameras. And one is this sort of alien looking thing walking up a hill. A lot of your viewers are probably familiar with it. Um, and so he's been on like all the TV shows and history channel and whatnot talking about this, but he was in one of those like virtual meetings recently and, uh, he was showing this picture and this guy raises his hand in the avatar virtual meeting and is like, Oh, I just sketched that recently. And he puts up the sketch and it was Olaf. And so Olaf was like in the same place with them and happened to sketch, uh, the same thing that he captured on his game camera from one of my students from, you know, 12, 13 years ago, who's, uh, you know, obviously a friend. Um, but he was just over here because we were shooting um, a, a TV series in that area where it was captured. Because there's just a ton of crazy things that have taken place around Deer Lodge, Montana, and the Redgate area specifically, going back decades, almost centuries. So, yeah, it was just kind of a funny coincidence. And they're actually, um, I think they're going to hire out 33 Ounce Creative to work with them on this TV project, too. So, there were some other synchronicities, but I thought that one was was kind of the funniest. No, I like that. I like I like those little things that pop up it, on a similar type of scale. I've just found out that um, 
One of my wife's friend's husband listens to this podcast and I've been standing in the school playground with him now for several years <laughs> and I don't think he knew that my kid went to the school and I was even there. So um, feel free to come up and say hello, mate, next time you see me standing yeah, in on my little boy. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, these, cool. these it's funny how these things get around. Uh, but yeah, 100% recommend. I don't want to get into trouble describing the cover of the book, okay? I'm going to leave that to you. If you want to just, <laughs> for the listeners who may not have seen the cover yet, um, what does it depict? Well, I mean, it's sitting right behind you. They could see it. The YouTube, but if dark. you're listening on audio, or the audio folks can. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I, I mean, even like looking at it, you can't tell the the interesting part. Um, so yeah, what happened? It was as a collaboration where I had an idea for what I wanted de- depicted in two different book covers. They actually made two of them for me, and I just shared the second one on on Twitter recently. And then I've seen off, that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think Dan reshared that one too. I reposted whatever the hell we're calling it now. Um, so it was, um, yeah, so I sent him the sketch, very, very crude sketch. I, I wish I had it to pull up to show you what I gave them and where they took it. Cause they're, it's the same idea, same layout, but obviously they, as professional artists, took it to a much better place. Um, so yeah, it's Jesus underneath a UFO, kind of hanging there, suspended in the air. And then as it wraps around the back, there's um, another UFO at a different time when Jesus is born. So it's shining light down into the the manger, so to speak. And there's a very good chance that the light that the three wise men followed in this um, this narrative was, was a UFO, is leading them to that place. And there's a lot of indications in general that UFOs um, may have been at the root of most major religions and a lot of lesser religions as well throughout history um, and probably into prehistory too. But those don't preserve. It's only when people write things down and start killing each other over them that they tend to propagate into the future. But yeah, um, I, I don't know which one it was. I'm guessing Dan took some creative liberties to have Jesus throw in a double bird on the front, which yeah. is... It was hilarious to me because I was like, did this, did this, did, did Andy give him a secret copy of the, <laughs> the script slash book? Cause I'm like, how did he know that that is completely apropos for Jesus's character in the book? So it was, it was a great addition. And he's, he's mentioned to me too, that uh, maybe next time you guys are on together, he can elaborate on this, but there's a, a number of Easter eggs too. I know one is that the stars are all in the exact position they would have been on the alleged uh, date of Jesus's birth and a, a number of other things too. He hasn't even told me what they all are yet, but uh, yeah, no, they did a great job with that one. And the other one was fantastic too, but this, um, this cover and especially because of his little modification to Jesus's hands, just fit the narrative uh, perfectly. So I went with that one. I um, I got the book quite a while ago. I was very fortunate and I didn't notice that till quite recently that that's actually what he was doing on the cover. I think just I just automatically assumed he was doing the whole, you know, Jesus arms out, that's it. But there's a UFO above him. Yeah, then, well, that's what I drew. Was... That's what I drew in my sketch. And then I saw that in the draft and I was like, oh, hell yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> Another thing most people haven't seen is if you turn it over on the back, uh, it's, I made it so it's hard to see. It's a little Easter egg of its own. But look right above the barcode. It's written in kind of light gray letters. Uh, oh, Mark of the Beast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even show that. You won't see that on the camera, folks. Well, but. somebody, somebody, no, you probably wouldn't on the camera, but somebody finally caught that. And I, I sent him like a T-shirt and some, you know, koozies and stuff as a little prize because I was waiting until, so it's easier to see on the, the hardback, but. Yeah, I, when I was growing up, like I, I was raised an evangelical Christian and all that stuff was beaten down my throat. Like, you know, the danger of barcodes and capitalism, which is one of many, many ironies with this particular group of people, uh, hypocrisies, you could say. But like they were always worried about, you know, getting chips put in us. And that was the mark of the beast. And just I don't know. So I, I kind of threw that in there just as a. Uh, a funny aside the whole the whole book satire so why not put some satire in the front too it's a satirical time travel science fiction novel the cover grabs the tone straight away and sets the tone but the the dedication caught me at the start as well it's quite a unique dedication um i won't go through the whole thing but it's uh, the work is dedicated to joan of arc 
Kathleen Van de Bulk, Galileo Galilei, Anne Kruger, Paul Henry Terry, Anne Goldie, and so on and so on, and finishes with John Lennon. What's the what's the thinking behind that that kind of cast of characters? Well, <clears throat> I don't know how it is in the UK, but here in the the US, we've had we've kind of been overrun by um, religious zealots who have taken over positions and and politics throughout the spectrum. Some places are worse than others, um, obviously. But then, if if you look at the actions and behaviors of these people who claim to be Christians, they're the exact opposite of everything Jesus taught and. And all of these other spiritual leaders, even, you know, circumscribing or related to or even far from Christianity, they're all saying similar things about loving each other, being empathetic, being nice, you know, um, not groping your your estranged boyfriend in a movie theater uh, with a bunch of kids around, you know, like, like there's just so much hypocrisy and it's so blatant and disgusting. I wrote this as kind of a pushback. You know, it's not it's not calling out Christianity at all. Like I said, I was raised in the church. A lot of my good friends and family are devout Christians who are good people. This is calling out all of those individuals who who I think I said in the book have a, a mouthful of scripture, but a heart full of bigotry and hate. It's it's the racist ones. It's the misogynistic ones. It's the ones that hide behind this book in order to manipulate people and to demean them and take rights away from them. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of, it, it, it's satire. That's what we do. You can do that through comedy. You can do that through satire, you know? And, and so the book I've been told is uh, hilarious by many people. And it's a good way to do that. You know, Richard Pryor, George Cartland, they're, they're talking about real issues that affect people today and throughout time, but doing it in a way that's more palatable and consumable because it's, it's funny. You can kind of laugh at the ridiculousness and the fuckery that is modern day society. So that um, that was kind of the main impetus for that. But your question specifically about the dedication was because there's so many people throughout history that have suffered at the hands of religious ideology. And so a number of those people are the, the first and most prominent and last witches to have been burned. Uh, Joan of Arc was, um, you know, subjected to that, not a witch, but just um, the religious ideology led to her demise, the guy that killed John Lennon, like all of these people who stood up and said, look, you know, there's a lot to this world. Maybe we should uh, consider uh, all of the other things going on with regard to belief systems and behaviors and, and, and fight that entrenched ideology that's come to dominate and prop up patriarchy for, for millennia. Some of the best satire, especially in the UK, some time ago was was a uh, comedy and uh, Blackadder. If anyone's familiar with the series, um, absolutely so fantastic. It? Uh, Black, it's called Blackadder. It's Rowan Atkinson who done Mister Bean. Um, okay, and it's, it's <laughs> really he much. was into satire. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. um, check that's out Blackadder. But that's um, there was elements of the book as I was going through going through, and I read parts at a time, different parts, and I was like, ah. It, that kind of stuff struck me, just the the crassness and the humour and whatnot. And um, the the back of I won't read the full description of the book, and I'm jumping from the front to the back now. Um, As society teeters on the brink of nuclear apocalypse, Marcus Moksha, an oversexed alcoholic anthropologist, encounters Dordoin, is how I've been pronouncing it in my head. Close enough. Right? It's, t- it's technically Dordogne. It's a region of okay. France where a lot of things yeah. happen with regard to early human evolution. Well, um, I, I knew it was a French region, but that's how I still pronounced it, which was wrong. Which yeah, that's, great. that's spot on. <laughs> I spent years pronouncing um, Hermione, Hermione in the Harry Potter book yeah. before the movies came out. So, <laughs> that's an easy uh, one to do, too. Uh, um, a telepathic woman from the future who recognises his import to the fate of humanity. She recruits him to join her team of time-travelling scientists aboard their UFO as they venture back through the distant past, seeking to enact a change that will bring peace to his time and avert the Great War. And it goes on a little bit more in the description, but that's a hell of a hook. Was that something as part of this overall TV project, was part of the pitch? This is what it's going to be. This is the story. Is that what you were hoping for? <laughs> no, not at all. Those are completely unrelated. Um, so the CEO died, and and we were getting pretty close. It was going to be a doco series about my first book. 
and they'd flown a camera crew out here. We did the the pitch deck, the sizzle reel, you know, the beat sheet for three different seasons. And yeah, tragically, the CEO just fell and hit his head and, and died. And, and I, I kind of got to know him. He was a great guy. His father did one of the first UFO documentaries in like the 60s, I think. And it kind of st- struck him at a young age. And he wanted to do this the exact same way I did. We had the same vision about obviously the entertainment component, but really keeping it grounded in science and, and evidence and what we can know and what we can't know and being honest about that. And um, yeah, and, and his brother, I don't know if I just mentioned this, I'm getting bad with the short term memory, but his, his brother was one of the cameramen. So I hung out with him a good amount here when they came out to my house to shoot it. And so it was just, it was just a tragic thing. I got a call at the, the grocery uh how do we call those things? Grocery center? Grocery store? Supermarket? Yeah, grocery store. See, yeah. I told you, my <laughs> mind's going, man. I got some kind of weird worms that are eating away at my brain or something. I don't know. Yeah, at the grocery store, and I get a call from the producer I was working with, and he's like, you know, man, I got some bad news. And so for a couple of weeks, I was like, well, what the hell am I going to do on sabbatical? Like you and I were talking about right before we came on the air. I can't just sit down and do nothing. You know, it drives mm. me absolutely insane. So um, one day I was like, all right, I got to figure this out. Took my kids to the bus stop um, and just like all morning, just kind of ruminated on the next step. You know, what, what am I going to do? And, and a book wasn't even on my mind. In fact, that was the furthest thing from it because I didn't even want to write another book because I just published the Extra Tempestra model a couple few months before that. So it was like the last thing on my mind, but um, given the state of mind I was in, may or may have not been an altered state of consciousness per se, but it just, yeah, I was like, this story popped in my head and I went, we got double showers. I went back, my wife was in the shower. I hopped in. She's like, so, you know, what'd you say? I was like, I'm going to write uh, another book. She's like, yeah, I kind of thought you would. I was like, but it's a novel. She's like, hmm, didn't see that coming. So yeah, I about a day later, I had to take my truck in to get serviced. And uh, I walked down to this place called Mackenzie River Pizza. It's a chain here in Montana. And I had this notebook on me and I just started writing. I was sitting there having a beer. I know the bartender there because uh, our kids are friends. And started writing, filled up this notebook, uh, grabbed another one out of my bag, filled that up. And yeah, the story just came pouring out. Um, it obviously evolved. You know, I had a, yeah. a number of beta readers because it, it wasn't great at first. In fact, it was horrible uh, at first because I didn't know how to organize things. And then fortunately, my neighbor here in the canyon is a, a pretty prolific novelist. So she told me about some resources to look up. I just consumed the hell out of those. Actually, I think that happened first. I consumed those and then I took my truck in and all the story came pouring out in the context of how you structure them. And yeah, you know, a lot of my beta readers gave me some really useful information. Um, didn't suggest that I make it less crass or less sexual, uh, which was nice. I was kind of afraid they'd be like, dude, you can't, you can't say this stuff. <laughs> I mean, they might have hinted at it a little bit, but I, I feel like that's kind of important for the story too. I think mm-hmm. it needs to challenge you a little bit and not just with regard, <clears throat> excuse me, to some of these ideologies and the hypocrisy that oozes out of them, but as far as your own comfort level with really sexual situations, rampant drug use, just extremely crass dialogue. So yeah, it all just kind of flowed together over the course of this week or two weeks. And, and then from that point on, it was all about fine tuning it. And then my editor really helped a lot, uh, obviously as editors do. So it was a, it was a pretty short, I think it was nine months. It was like having a little book baby as far as impregnation and, and birth. Yeah, I like that. And it's not just what's been said and who's saying it, but also like not to spoil too much, but who's saying it, you know, the titular, <laughs> yeah. the son of God there is, does make an appearance within the book. The, and The son of God is maybe my favorite character in the entire <laughs> thing. Yeah, um, probably carrying directly on from his appearances in South Park, more or less, um, <laughs> the way, <laughs> taking it up a notch or two. But oh, I, I forgot I, about that. Yeah, he was in that Oh, show. yeah. Yeah, I've started watching it again recently. Um, mm. Do you think this book is is more you 
than the previous two books? Has this got more of your personality, maybe either split amongst the characters or just within the book itself? Hmm, that's a great question. I, I also, I appreciate being able to talk about this. Like, I've been on a number of shows since it came out, and we we talk about it, but this is the first deep dive, so I, I appreciate this long uh, questioning. I'm all good. Um, yeah, I think, I, I mean, there must be, you know, because you write what you know, um, and, and how can you, in whatever version of this embodied form uh, exists, how can that not come out through your writing, I guess? So, yeah, I mean, I, I'd had a lot of jokes in my first two books, but my editor was like, I see what you're doing here. You're trying to appeal to your academic colleagues, but also people interested in this phenomenon. You want them to take it seriously. These jokes are funny. Don't get me wrong, but I would take them all out. So I did. I just took a cleaver and carved them all out patched it up, published it with no jokes. And that was hard for me. The second book has a lot of my dry sense of humor. Like if you listen, you'll, he'll be like, Oh, that, that was actually kind of funny. But this one was, yeah, more about, um, just fun with words, fun with situations, um, fun with sex and drugs and religion and politics and all the things we're not allowed to talk about normally just Mm. put in there, you know, like in polite conversation, we're not allowed to talk about, uh, political situations or, uh, certainly not that, you know, <laughs> Christianity was the result of UFO intervention. That's not something you bring up at the Thanksgiving table. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I, the chains could kind of come off a little bit is what I'm saying. Like I could be me, but it's also not just me. Um, it's, it's a lot of my experiences through life. It's a lot of people I've known and their experiences get put in there. And then just things that I guess were channeled from the ether. I don't know how else to say it because I feel like some of it didn't even come from me at all, which is kind of weird to say out loud, I guess. Do you think that the fact that the first two books were censored in a way that you were told, you know, take take that little bit of you out of there, take the humor out. And I think I can see that in the podcast. Like I probably spent two years trying to be really straight and serious and mm-hmm. I don't want to sound like me because I need to just, don't make it about me. It's about the guests. Well, people the love you, people. Andy. People love so, you, some, man. some people seem to, but not everyone will. But, you know, ask my wife. But well. it, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that you, over time, you, people will get to trust you and you can be a bit more of yourself. And I found that Absolutely. on the podcast. And even like myself and Dan, we can do that more now without going to, you know, let's do a slapstick comedy and be bashing each other over the head during like a 20-minute, a you know, serious that piece could, on US congressional cool hearings. You guys got to do at least one of those, though, before the run's up. Oh yeah, down the line, yeah, that that'd be a live show. That could end it all. But do, do you not think <laughs> awesome. your first two books being censored in that way, like, allows you to the, do this for a third book and kind of throw the shackles off in maybe a way that wouldn't have happened? Well, I mean, I wouldn't have an audience if it wasn't for the first two books. But no, I mean, I struggled with this too. It's it's very different, you know. It, it gets the idea out, which is fundamental to all mm. of this. It's the main reason I've done any of this is the idea is worth considering. It explains a lot of the UFO phenomenon. It can't explain all of it, but it makes a lot of sense with regard to what we see happening. And so that's that's paramount. That's the main goal, is just to get the idea out. And if I can have three different ways of doing that, three books that appeal to different people, you know, I've been very honest, like if you're religious or a far white far right lunatic, uh, far white lunatic. Is that a Freudian slip? Um, or, you know, if, if you're easily offended by drugs, sex, and rock and roll, don't read this book. You know, it's not for you and that's fine. It doesn't have to be for everybody, but the people who are the target demographic have loved it so far. And that's been great to see. And what's funny is that, you know, <laughs> I realized this even before it was published. I was in Paris with, uh, some good friends of ours who live here in Butte or in Portugal and then met us in Paris. And then we went south to the Dordogne, um, took a, a lovely canoe trip down the Dordogne. Um, but they met us in Paris and I was kind of talking about this new book project. They hadn't read either of my first two books. They bought them just to support me as a friend and author, but they hadn't read them and didn't really care. And a lot of people don't, they're not super into this, but we were in the catacombs and I was kind of describing uh, the origins and, and what this book's about. And they were both like, oh shit, you got to tell us as soon as that comes out. 
And, it, and that's what I found. Like all my friends who have been supportive but haven't read anything dove straight into this book and loved it. And, and that to me is an indication that what I was trying to do worked and is working, where you can write these same ideas in a way um, that appeals to the people who I wasn't reaching with the other books, mm-hmm. you know? So, so it's, it's not, and, and that's, that was the end goal. You know, I, I didn't know I was going to write this book, but clearly there was some sort of future to past relationship. I mean, I've had that my entire life with dream precognition and, and conscious precognition. So it doesn't sound crazy to me to say that, even though it probably sounds crazy to some of your listeners, but yeah, it was like, now that I see it looking back and, and maybe even sending this thought back to my former self, um, it's, it's three very different books, like I said, at the top of the show, that explain the same idea, which is the most important aspect of this, in three very different ways to appeal to different audiences. And as you, you mentioned, the extra tempestral models become kind of popular because it's right in the middle. You yeah. don't have to have a scientific background. You don't have to be uh, a, a pot-smoking hippie. It's, it's just right there in the middle. You know, it's got it's stories. So people can listen to these stories. It's like a short story book that brings in the science and creates a holistic narrative about this time travel theory. But you don't have to have any background in anything. You just have to enjoy a good story. And I think most people do. Yeah, I think more and more we're seeing different forms of media embracing the UFO topic and the UFO conversation and trying to present it in a different way to, to a different audience. You see, and I, I struggle with it, but tiktok's massive these days and you can reach hundreds of yeah. thousands of people with a 30 second video you know that just goes huge and reaches worldwide you know audiences in, in, in minutes um whereas you know people could spend years writing a really deep well-researched book that sits on a shelf and sells a thousand copies worldwide yet some kid in their basement with a green screen background can hit 10 million people in minutes saying yeah. you know real really basic level stuff um and i think that's just a sign of the times tom DeLong has done what he's done over the years for the ufo topic some people love it some people hate it some people are unsure he's got monsters in california coming out as we speak in two weeks which is a movie looks like scooby-doo for adults but all about the ufo and the paranormal that's going to be monsters in california um it's it's been due to come out for a while but yeah 6th of october it gets its streaming release and nice. you would expect, given Tom DeLong's background, this is going to have a lot of Easter eggs in it, much like your book does of things he has found and learned, theories he's put together, presented in the form of a movie. Um, so a lot of folks cool. are looking forward to that. Um, and I don't want to spoil much of the book or the story. We've touched on elements of it, but the book goes into themes that have become quite popular in the discussion over the last couple of years. Cataclysms, warring factions... Is that yeah. conversation of recent times, was that the influence or is that a story you were keen to tell for some time anyway? Both, yeah. So, you know, the, the let's call it the Colt Hart Milburn theory, because um, both have claimed to have been in contact with members of the intelligence community. And some of them reached out to me as well around the same time where all three of us are being told very similar things that does center on, on a cataclysm an impending cataclysm of some sort. And yeah, it's, you know, and then it kept coming up in podcast interviews and stuff. And I think actually, yeah, I think your show is even cited in my second book um, because you and I were talking about it and I referenced mm-hmm. both of them. Cause I think we delved into this uh, and yeah, yeah. that last interview. Yeah. So I, I incorporate that in the book. So people have a resource to go, you know, see what it is that people are talking about. And then listed a couple of Colt Hart and Frank Milburn's interviews as well, because yeah, if there is any validity to this, it's a very important question and may have even been the impetus for this book. Oddly, um, the day I published this book, someone reached out to me and, and was asking about its origins. And it turns out he wrote a very similar story that published the exact same day. And we had no contact with each other, no knowledge of each other's projects. I didn't even know he or his book existed. Um, and there's just been sort of this, the, the oddities with our collective consciousness. Like I can't do a podcast without it going straight into consciousness and, and near-death experiences and psychedelics and all of these things that are, are people who've never talked about these on podcasts that don't have anything to do with it. 
and are just like, I need to talk about this with someone. And they are, they're finding, you know, a lot of people to discuss these things with backgrounds in it. Um, it, it's not something historically that I was super involved with. I was raised as a, a reductionist materialist uh, through that sieve that they push us through in graduate school in the hard sciences. But ever since getting into this UFO thing, I've gone deep in that sort of spiritualist Eastern mysticism type of uh, knowledge base because it seems to get closer to the fundamental aspects of reality than does anything available in this physical world. I, I feel like this is actually emergent. And a lot of other people are saying the same thing. And it's crazy how much that happens. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think the impetus for this came from a lot of places, but that was certainly an important jumping off point. You know, what if, and I do discuss this in the extra tempestra model too. I think it's chapter or the case study 12 or 13, because it's important to address it uh, in both the block universe model and the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Because if there's different branching timelines, that cataclysm looks very, very different than if there's one unified self-consistent timeline. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have that conversation because, you know, and it does kind of get back to the nature of time, nature of reality, but if I'll just, I'll just let people read that one. Cause it's, it's way too complicated to get into right now, but it's an important question that then as that book ended, I can already see in uh, whatever this, our minds are a connection from that to this long before I even knew this book was going to exist. So it's almost like all three already existed as one entity. And this was just that third part, that final part, to that question of cataclysm, but then bringing in a lot of other esoteric aspects of the UFO phenomenon. I had another friend, again, never interested in anything else I did, who was reading this book. And he's like, he texts me one day, he's like, man, I got to tell you, I'm actually learning a ton of stuff from this book. I thought it was just going to be literary, lit literary nonsense. And, you know, but I, I'm learning things about historic cases in the UFO community. It's, I consider it a hard science fiction novel because there's a lot of technical things about how yeah. these craft might work and about how time travel works that a lot of people aren't familiar with. So it's still educating with regard to this theory, just in a very, very different way. Yeah. And even like your, your traditional book, and I'm no author, so I'm going to bastardize this, but you're used to seeing parts of the book with long descriptive paragraphs of what's happening. But given the kind of scripted layout of this, it's the characters that do that for you. They introduce yeah. the scene, they tell you what's going on just in their conversation, the kind of back and forward, the chats throughout it, which is really interesting. And you mentioned all those different ideas, like, and you recently gave a talk, I'll put the link in the description uh, at Phoenix Mufon back in May, where... Yeah. You're, you're associated now, like it or not, with the extra tempestrial model. People talk about Michael Masters as the future humans guy, the time traveling, you know, aliens. That's that's what yeah, you are. Yeah, actually, met, I met David Childress in an elevator in 2019. He's the guy from Ancient Aliens for yep. people that aren't familiar. And he, it was just me and him. And he looks over at me and goes, "Hey, you're the time travel guy, right?" <laughs> <laughs> and this was this was like three months after my first book came out and I was already being branded as the time travel guy. So th I thought that was kind of funny. Did you turn into like a mini fist bump to yourself? Just like, yes, that's <laughs> it. You've, you've made it. I mean, at that time I wasn't a huge fan of the show, so it wasn't <laughs> like a celebrity moment for yeah. me or anything. In fact, I railed against a particular uh, episode they did in a, a published article about pseudoscience. So no, I wasn't like, you know, getting in the elevator with Matthew McConaughey or something. It was just, <laughs> It was more about him recognizing me and yeah. branding me that from a very, very early stage in the process. And it's like, and you, you take it, I'm sure, as a, a as a as a positive thing that people note note you for that. And in 2023, people read headlines; they don't read the articles, so it's very high level praise everyone kind of gets and gets labeled with. But I think it's fair to say, given the talk I watched that you do. You extra terrestrial, crypto terrestrial, ultra terrestrial, gin, demons, angels, all these different labels don't necessarily have to be different things. This can all be the one thing, just either misrepresented, misidentified, or just misunderstood in, in a different way. Is that right? 
Yeah, or just focusing on one small aspect of it without the entire picture. And and yeah, it, over the last, I'd say, six to eight months, I've sort of been realizing how if you do interject that all-important time variable, and as I say in the the lecture, I'm not trying to just whitewash everything with time. I'm not saying that everything can be explained by time. But if you just challenge your mind and stick it in there, it, it helps explain a lot of these seemingly different models. And, and even Hal Putoff, I used his paper as a jumping off point for this, where he says it, it could be any or all of these. Yeah. And I was kind of looking at all. And if you do interject time, you can see that. So like the walking amongst us thing, that's been the big buzzword lately. Um, people have clearly been contacted by occasionally sat down and had conversations with these telepathic, highly consciously evolved beings who are human, just like us. And so how is that possible? Well, <clears throat> what I argue is that if you have future humans who through these hybridization programs, which are clearly happening, there's almost no denying that in the UFO community, at least obviously Neil deGrasse Tyson would say I'm crazy, but I don't care what he thinks about anything because he doesn't know anything about this. <laughs> um, so if you take individuals from say 10,000 years ago, and hybridize them with yourself from, say, 10 or 20,000 years in the future, you will get something that looks a lot like modern humans. But if you tweak that genetic code, or maybe you don't even have to, they would still be imbued with all of those high consciousness characteristics that allow for telepathy and the communication of complex thoughts in short periods of time, uh, packages of information, if you will. So, and then I think as far as the breakaway civilization, and I kind of rail against that because it pisses me off and it's dumb. Um, but as far as that idea, again, if you have uh, the, the main thing, two, two things I point out, and I'll keep this brief because it like the, the, the debunkers, this is one of those things that kind of sets me off a little bit. It's a trigger point, you could say. Um, but there's absolutely no archaeological evidence that you ever had a complex civilization prior to the advent of agriculture about 12,000 years ago. And even then, it took almost 12,000 years to have anything that could even leave this planet. So if there's no archaeological evidence for it, and it just doesn't make sense because simple always comes before complex. Culture builds on top of what came before. It's cumulative and it's compounding. It accelerates, but you can never have complex come before simple except in the presence of a time machine. Because with a time machine, as Igor Novikov says, the past, present, and the future are all one. None of them come before or after the others. You can have a future cause and a past effect. So in that case, you know, you can say we do destroy this planet. You know, we launch the nukes. They're not able to shut them down. Interestingly, it's, it's weird type side tangent. I was in a conference call with uh, three staff members of our senator, our sitting senator, John Tester, yesterday with Robert Salas and uh, Richard O'Connor and Joan Bird. So just to talk about. The, the, this nuclear connection with UFOs, with our sitting senator, his staff, who convey this information. We had this long document. Um, so they shut down. I didn't know this. Like I'd heard of Robert Salas, but I'd never really followed. But he was, he was here in Montana. He was at the Malmstrom Air Force Base. They took 10 of these missiles offline at the same time. They shut down one. Yeah. Alarms go off. They're all looking around like, oh, shit. And then all of a sudden, all nine go blank. There was another one, I guess, like, uh, a couple months earlier, and then the, the Mino, Mino Air Force Base in North Dakota was right around that time, all around like the mid-60s, 67. So if they are able to, you know, not shut them down, and us, I think I said in the the lecture, uh, drunk monkeys juggling chainsaws or something like that, because we have these weapons that could not only destroy vast swaths of the human population, but our ecology, our biome, the planet that they're set to inherit. And a lot of it was uh, was about, you know, what who would care it, unless they have some vested interest in this plan, unless they're stakeholders in the sanctity yeah. of this shared earth after we're done with it. But say something does happen, or you just have uh, some people who are really interested in a specific region, a specific time. So they jump over, you have complex jumping over all of those periods that led to them, simple, slightly more advanced, accelerating curve, jump all the way over it, set up shop on an Island and I, I really played with this theme a lot in Revelation with regard to Dordogne, where she had come from. She was one of these people who went back and lived at Atlantis. You know, maybe this was what Atlantis was, is future humans that go and set up 
shop in a very pristine area of the world that predates any of us fucking it up over the course of this 12,000 year period post agriculture, especially post industrial over the last 200 years. So then we might have indications of an advanced civilization that predates humans simply again because of time travel. The jinn, the genies, I mean, they're the ones walking amongst us and they probably have been for millennia. So you have these telepathic people that are interacting with uh, people who eventually write things down. That's going to work its way into your historical record. So, and there's others too, you know, I even talk about how the, the extraterrestrial hypothesis could be explained in the context of, of, future human time travelers. So again, I'm not just trying to say it's all time, it's all time, but I would challenge all of your listeners to just kind of step back and think about all these different things with the time variable included in that analysis in either the block universe or the many worlds interpretation. Yeah. And I think it's an interesting one, especially you mentioned the the nuclear thing that you know, you've got a sect of folks who would say, oh, the aliens will stop or whatever it is will stop as if we try and launch a nuclear war. And I've spoken to officials that straight away, their first point is they don't stop any number of nuclear tests that happen on a daily basis. The thousands of tests that go on underwater, above water or whatever else on the planet throughout the year for decades and decades and decades, they allow those to happen. So it's a very, very, very small number yeah. at all that have ever been turned off, switched off, and been witnessed. Everything That's else true. is just allowed to happen. And like you say, it would make sense that if something could bypass that and go, yeah, this this point in time is what it is, but we can go to a point where that doesn't matter, or we can bypass that and know that it because of X, Y, and Z, it doesn't make a difference. So, yeah, I, I, can, I can totally see that. Um, I want to just get on to a few more things. Just one more thing, though, on the book. Um What's been your favorite reaction so far from someone who has read the book? And you've touched on a few (laughs) friends, family and whatnot. And just given the nature of the book, and you've mentioned plenty of times, I've not had to do it, how different it is to the others. What's been the kind of best reaction you've had? Uh, My favorite reaction was, I won't name any names because it's someone people might know. Um, But my favorite reaction was how I'd hired two voice actors to do this book um, because it was too much for me to do. Like, yeah, I could get into character and try to pretend to be these people, but um, that it would be garbage. So I decided not to do that. Hired professional actors to do the two main female and two main male characters over the course of a couple months. You know, we're talking about this, how we want the characters to be developed. And um, yeah, they sent me the first eight chapters of one of the two of the females. And then I get a call the next day, well, a, a weird cryptic email that says, um, before you start working on these, I'd, I'd like to have a phone conversation. I'm like, okay. Next day I call him. <laughs> it's very long and highly uh, well thought out and very polite um, statement building up to how they're Christians and they can no longer work on this project. And I was like, well, okay, a couple of things. I, they, they, you know, did voiceovers for porn and stuff. So it wasn't the crassness, you know. Yeah. It was just about the way certain biblical figures are depicted in this yeah. narrative. And one in particular that sort of set them off a little bit. You might be able to guess which one. Highly <laughs> sexualized character from the middle of the book. Um, And I was like, well, also, you know, this book isn't railing against Christianity. If anything, it boosts up the original teachings of Jesus, which this religion is named after, you know, like it's it's about the hypocrisy and the, the bigots and the people have taken this story and hide behind a fake Jesus they created in their own mind to legitimize all of the hatred that they have in their hearts. And he's like, well, yeah, I get that. I was like, have you actually read the book? He's like, no, I got to that part and I kind of bailed on it. Uh, Because it was, you know, I I don't know what you're trying to do here, but whatever it was, you did it. You did it well, is what he told me. And then, yeah, he bailed on the whole project. So that was that was interesting, especially because he had had the book for two months. I just assumed he read it before he agreed to do this, but they were working through it and then got to the part that they were like, yeah, I can't I can't be a part of this. I will burn in hell. I mean, that's that's a reaction for sure. Um, yeah. Listen, uh, we're going to go to the rest of the stuff now. Uh, 
but book Revelation, The Future Human Past. You can get it now. It's been out for a while. If you've got it, let us know what you think. I'm sure Michael would love you to leave a review of it because I know every single author asks the same thing. Please go onto Amazon or whatever site you can. Leave a five star review. Leave a comment. It's always much yeah. Goodreads too. Goodreads, Goodreads, Goodreads on Amazon yep. definitely help, especially when a book just came and it just came out two or three months ago. So yeah, I I, I would reiterate that. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, it's it's everyone always asks, and yeah, any kind of review and leave the podcast a review while you're at it. Highly recommend it, folks. It's, and if you've got those others, identified flying objects, extra tempestual model buy this complete your trilogy this is michael masters nolan trilogy here for batman um or go and pick <laughs> up those other ones anyway i'm sure amazon will recommend them all at the same time that is all for this week's show thank you very much for listening please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform you can like retweet and subscribe that would all be very much appreciated the shows are being uploaded onto youtube as we speak more and more you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that ufo podcast to access the show is ad free as well please get in touch on twitter facebook instagram that ufo podcast of course on twitter it's at ufo uap am and again folks as always keep looking up you never know what you might see it wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer more like a hubcap designed by chaucer a little baroque and quite steampunk like alice was playing bass for the parliament of the little fucker hovered right outside of my window and when i shoved out the screen he made it an issue i don't think he expected me to see his ass but i'd had some champagne and smoked a little bit. The game is dateful on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. Then I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head. And everything was weird and everything was red. And I helped out my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toy. They thought it was my problems and they think I should seek therapy and I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me.